thank you and compliments for the, the both uh, presentations. I have a, a short remark to uh, Professor Runia. I uh, didn't understand ever why uh, the Netherlands uh, didn't have an own national code uh, independent from the uh, French tradition, not even after the uh, third codification or the, due to the third codification. And now I have an idea on the basis of uh, your uh, presentation or, or thoughts that uh, you, you told that uh, uh, between, it was between the uh, uh, two world wars that uh, the legal science, the Dutch legal science uh, was uh, considered as uh, too radical. Yeah? And maybe it was the case also uh, in the first half of the uh, 19th century that uh, Dutch legal science were, was also that time maybe too radical or, or it was too developed due to the uh, R uh, Roman law tradition uh, flourishing in the Netherlands since the late uh, uh, 16th century. Thank you. Uh, dear colleague, I, I understand you are uh, also teaching Roman law, and um, I, have, I have an interesting uh, addition for you. Uh, Mayas researched actually what happened in the beginning of the 19th century, so before, uh, well, when the French civil code was still applicable, and, uh, uh, also, well, before two years, the, the, the code adapted for the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Uh, but he looked at the university, and he looked at what subjects were taught uh, until 1830. Um, and then it turned out, even though Roman law was not applicable at all, because it had been abolished uh, when the codifications were introduced, uh, but at Leiden University, the students spent still 30 hours per week on Roman law, and only six hours per, year, per week on uh, the, actually the law that, was, that they had to uh, deal with in the uh, Dutch Civil Code, or the French Civil Code, I should say. Um, so, yeah, legal science, I think, did not have a lot of time to uh, get a good basis. Um, I get a question addressed to Professor Biel, uh, but I'm not sure whether it's possible at all to give a general answer. If you take a look at cost efficiency, and I'm not talking about the hourly wages of, of lawyers, but I'm thinking of the preparation of a contract, I'm thinking of disputes brought before courts, do you think that one of the systems has an advantage against the other system, taken from the standpoint of cost efficiency? I think that's an almost impossible question to answer without a great deal of empirical work, because um, it's so hard to know really what the difference is. I mean, I felt a lot of sympathy with what Professor Menihard was saying yesterday about what judges are really doing under a civilian system. And it doesn't sound to me very different to what judges are doing in a common law system, except the starting point is different. Rather than sort of basing yourself on a code text, you're basing yourself on previous decisions in the English system. But it doesn't sound to me to be very different. What I think is very different is the procedure, particularly, uh, I mean, as I understand it, uh, uh, <coughs> in, in many civilian countries, I can't generalize because I, I, I don't know enough, most of the procedure is in writing and oral argument is used just as a little top up and sometimes not used at all. Uh, whereas in England, we basically still start with oral argument, and that course changes the cost implications enormously. Now, I'm not trying to defend oral argument, um, but I remember we had a... I was privileged to attend a meeting, uh, a sort of friendly conversation meeting between English judges and German judges, um, where... <coughs> Uh, we were sitting over dinner, and uh, one of the German Supreme Court judges said, uh, we have to hear a case tomorrow. 
um, about such and such. I've written my judgment, I just need to tidy it up. Now, that would be completely anathema to an English judge. You can't write your judgment until you've heard the arguments. Um, but you can see that that makes it very, very difficult to deal with, as it were, the cost efficiency of the system. Um, <clears throat> one of the mysteries is why English litigation is so expensive. Um, I don't think it's just that English lawyers are more greedy than others. Um, that may be part of the explanation. They certainly seem, um, city lawyers certainly seem to be very well paid. My son is one and he's earning far more than I've ever dreamt of um, without apparently having to work that hard. <laughs> uh, don't tell him that. Um, but I think the way that things are organized in England, it's very much orientated towards big disputes where the legal costs are relatively minor compared to the amount at stake. And we don't deal very well with smaller cases, either in procedural terms or, and this was what I was actually arguing uh, before when I was talking about the, uh, in a previous presentation, when I was talking about the, uh, the differences between English law and the common law generally and many of the civilian systems, I don't be be believe that English law deals very well with small business parties. Consumers, we all deal with pretty much the same, but small businesses are neglected in England, and I think that's a major problem. So I'm not trying to defend our system, but to say which is more effective, I, I, I think it's almost impossible. If I were 25 and starting a legal career again, that would be an interesting question to start with, but I'm certainly not going to try at 75, because... <laughs> Thank you. you. You just mentioned now that empirical work is needed. And I remember reading some 20 years ago a piece of paper which tried to demonstrate with empirical data that common law jurisdiction all over the world are far better in, in economic terms than civil law jurisdictions. And they were looking to Latin America, to Africa, and to glo global south generally former colonies of the European countries. Uh, then there was the dispute uh, five years ago with the World Bank reports on rule of law and the French say, stating that they are uh, misguided and they are putting the French system uh, lower than it should and so on. This is the answer with the procedure and the World Bank promised to change the uh, uh, the apparatus of putting together those, uh, those data. But I think that putting together the two arguments, it results that it's not necessarily about how the, uh, the judges think. Because as you said, judges think alike. Uh, and judges don't like changes, uh, both in the common law system and in the civil law systems. In, in my country, there is a total reluctance of the judges in changing the civil code. They were expecting the day before the civil code was to enter into force, they were saying, maybe it will not enter into force. This was the, uh, the debate. But I think the idea is that when you are based on statutes, on generally applicable statutes, then the politician's power in changing the law is greater. This means less stability because they often change their mind at least four year, each four years. And also, this means that they are more inclined, especially in this period, to be populistic. So basically, to look at very pointy problems that are that day on the agenda and not to think to the overall thing. While in the common law systems, this evolution is more conservative. It, the changes are more gradual than sudden. I don't know if this brings anything to, to the discussion. Well, thank you. I think it's an interesting point. Um, 
strangely enough, I, I, I'd like just to, to point out a, a difference between your position and mine, I think, or the position in your country and the position in mine. My impression is that it's not the English judges who are reluctant to change things. They seem to be pretty flexible. Um, it's not even the bar, it's the firms of solicitors, because they have this enormous investment in know-how and people who are, our legal education is not particularly good. I mean, at least we don't spend quite so much time on Roman law anymore, uh, though I did as a student. Um, <clears throat> but they have trained people to do particular tasks and how adaptable they would be uh, to a new system, I don't know. But they have a vested interest in the status quo. Um, I think judges in England are not particularly efficiency-minded in the sense that the American writers would like them to be. They don't do law and economics. But nonetheless, they have a pretty keen business sense, many of them, because they have been representing big businesses uh, as barristers. And so they do tend to have quite, um, uh, to decide things in a way that's relatively efficient, even by uh, the American economists type standard. But it's a very interesting question, and I, I can't say more. Um, but my sense is that the real conservatism is with the big firms. Um, for example, security interests. You have told me this morning you've just ad or recently adopted an Article 9 type system for security interests. We have tried and tried in England to get something like that. We've tried saying you should adopt the whole thing. We've tried saying you should adopt little bits of it. They're not interested. I have a feeling that if, if the English solicitors were running our railways, we'd still be traveling by steam train. Um, you know. <laughs> Professor Schauer, you mentioned that in Austria, the ABGB in field of inheritance law was amended in the way that the language were modernized, was modernized. Uh, will you expect the same, in, the same approach in other, field of, uh, in other fields of law in ABGB? I haven't seen that in any, in any other branch of law. Um, the reform of succession law is the only example which I know for this kind of amendment or for this kind of reform which actually was just, a, if you look at the substantive ch changes, it was just a very small reform. It had important elements in the field of compulsory shares and some other clarifications, but most of it was just a translation. And this is the only example I know for that kind of amendment. Yes, but what, what, do, you expect for, uh, what do you expect for the future? Will uh, the ministry follow this approach also in other fields of AGVG because the language uh, of ABGB is very archaic, archaic and sometimes is especially for not for a native speaker uh, very difficult to understand the old German uh, old German language of ABGB. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> basically, I agree with you. Um, I would rather say that about 50% of the provisions we have in the civil code today date back to 1811, and the other 15% have been amended later time. Uh, but uh, I fully agree with you that uh, parts, of the la parts of the provisions, about 50%, are based on that old language. Uh, and I can tell you from my experience at the University in Vienna that sometimes even students have the uh, difficulties to understand uh, the law. Uh, this might be one of the reasons why they don't use the law, the law at all. They just look into the textbooks and, uh, and say, well, it's written in a textbook that it's that way. And, and they are very surprised uh, when you tell them, would you please open uh, uh, the text of the law? Uh, but to come back to your questions, I do not have any idea that uh, the way the succession law was amended would be an example for future reforms. Thank you. They were fascinating presentations. I wonder, though, if I can go back to a, a general question, which I sort of posed yesterday. Who is the code written for? 
Is it for lawyers or is it for, for example, business people who have some, trans uh, some knowledge of transactions to be able to understand? I, I don't expect anybody expects that the, the person on the street, like you know, the, the un totally unqualified person, will understand a code. I mean, it seems to me that the style and the language are really quite problematic. Um, when, when we were taught at working on the principles of European contract law, Ole Lando was insistent that this should be something which business people could understand. If you compare the language of most of the draft common frame of reference with the language of the PECL, you will see that they are com it's completely different. Um, and that is because the, the chief draft person, who was actually not von Bahr, it was Eric Clive who was doing the, the detailed work, took the view that the draft common frame of reference, which was thought of as being a guide for legislators, should be technically correct. So, for example, we used to talk about terminating a contract in Peckle. He said, that's not correct. When a contract comes to an end because one party's broken it, the contract isn't ended, you can still sue on it, but the contractual obligations come to an end. And he insisted on this sort of technical correctness, which, I must confess, uh, Leosh may have a different view, but I found it really quite hard to deal with that sort of thing. When we came back to the common European sales law, we persuaded Eric, who was still working on it, that you know, now we were dealing with something which, again, should be understandable for business. And I'm glad to say that he, after a little bit of discussion, we persuaded him. But it seems to me that the language in which you put your civil code is quite important, depending on who you're trying to reach. And certainly my impression is that the German civil code is talking to lawyers. The French civil code originally, perhaps, was talking to citizens. How do you view it in Austria and in the Czech Republic? So since I'm the first one to be addressed, I would try the first answer. I think that's a very, very good and very interesting question. Um, perhaps I could start with a historic notion. Uh, when the Austrian Civil Code was uh, prepared more than 200 years ago, uh, one of the authors, the main author of the uh, Austrian Civil Code, Franz von Seiler, had a very clear idea. And he said uh, the law should be addressed to educated people. They don't have to be lawyers, but educated people, not to everybody, but a guy who has some kind of education should be able to understand it. And perhaps this is some, something you could also today use as a basic element. I don't know. On the other hand, I have always admired, I, I think the speaker from Switzerland, perhaps she's not here anymore today, I always have admired the Swiss style of legislation because in my view, uh, they are able to make a very good combination of preciseness on one side and easy understanding on the other side. Uh, to me, this would be the ideal model. So, thank you very much. I must agree. So, uh, but um, it's a difficult question as, uh, as to the results. Uh, but I totally understand uh, the problem with uh, different drafters of the civil code. Therefore, for example, with regard to the Czech civil code, there was only one drafter. Actually, that was Professor Eliash who wrote all provisions just to keep a certain coherent approach. So all 3,000 provisions were drafted by him. No one else had an opportunity. Of course, he didn't succeed at the, at the, in, in Parliament, but uh, the original draft was drafted by one, uh, by, uh, by, by one person. And as to the quality of language, the language was somehow criticized as old-fashioned. So since it was said the uh, source was uh, the draft from 1937 and Professor Eliash is oriented at that era, uh, era uh, as well. So the language was a little bit um, uh, criticized uh, in, um, in jurisprudence and in, in parliament. But at the, at, at the end, I think it's not, so, it's, it's not so bad and definitely it's more comprehensible than other acts. And as to the quality, whether it shall be accessible to normal people, I think I cannot repair TV set. 
And I cannot expect that the repairer of TV set will understand the law. I think that this question of uh, uh, legal language is something like, uh, uh, requires some expertise in, 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 in the field and uh, it uh, cannot be in the end uh, in a different way. I understand that basic rules must be uh, apparent, obvious for everyone, so everyone can read and understand I have to pay, I have to do something, but at the end it is, uh, it is set in a field of expertise and the language must correspond to that. Professor Weger also has a yes. question, please. Only one sentence to this very important question, language of the codification. I think the most problematic field concerning the language is the codification in the European Union. And, and, and that, that, that's why uh, but, uh, with the uh, adoption of these rules into a national code, for instance, into Hungarian code, it's, it's really a hard, hard work and sometimes even impossible sometimes even impossible. I can mention the example of the two uh, digital uh, contract uh, in, uh, directives uh, from 2020 or so. And now perhaps two, two questions. One question to Professor Schauer. Uh, what is your personal uh, view about these two proposals of the two working groups concerning uh, liability questions. Were they really so uh, unuseful or, or almost important to transport into the code? And one short question to our uh, two friends from Olomutz, namely, what were the main reasons to keep these dualistic approach in your codification process, Co civil law and commercial law? Uh, well, first of all, uh, discussion on the reform of tort law has come to an end about 15 years ago. So this is a process which is over now. And there is no sign that it will be resumed again in the near future. Uh, but when you take a look at the two drafts, um, it's very interesting because it is a test on methodology. And as I mentioned in my presentation, one of the drafts was based on Walter Wilburg's flexible system, and the other draft was based on an opposite model, which tried to um, provide for very precise rules, which were not as flexible as the other ones. And um, even so, I was not a member of either of those working groups, my personal preference was the draft of the second working group. Um, I think we, we discussed about the flexible system yesterday, and I do not want to resume the uh, discussion in a very broad way, but just to add some sentences. Uh, when you apply a flexible system, uh, courts will be enthusiastic because the flexible system provides a lot of freedom, a lot of liberty for judges. They can find, they have a broad range of different solutions. Uh, so courts are enthusiastic about it. Uh, when you are a practicing lawyer, whose task also is to provide for a kind of legal certainty, legal security, a flexible system is not a very good idea. And when we had a discussion uh, in the field of tort law, and there were conferences and symposiums about that, uh, representatives of insurance industry said, if the draft of the first working group would be adopted based on the flexible system, premiums for liability insurance would increase a lot. Because nowadays we have a case law which is not the best thing when you have a codification. But the case law for the expert provides to a certain degree kind of legal security. And when you have a completely new draft based on the flexible system, you might go back to the start again. You lose the legal security you had before, which was based on the court practice. And so that was one of the reasons why insurance industry said, well, 
premium for liability insurance would go up. So that's just an economic argument, but I think it's important as well. As to your question, I would just emphasize that uh, our contemporary civil code is based on a monistic system. Yeah? But I understand that you spoke about the situation in, 90s, in 1991. Then uh, we had two codes, uh, civil code and commercial code. But uh, it was, uh, I, I don't know exactly the reasons, but uh, I think uh, since at that time, I, I'm not sure, I, I didn't study at the, at the university, university at the time. <laughs> so, uh, but I think that uh, as far as I know, the reason was similar to, to, to the reason which was mentioned already by Professor Schauer with regard to that amendment. There were different people assigned with the task. And that's the one reason I think that civil code uh, was, uh, the amendment of civil code was prepared by uh, Professor Planck and Professor Knapp, if I am right, and commercial code was uh, prepared by um, Professor Stuna and uh, Professor Kopacz. And uh, I, I think that uh, they considered the necessity to have two codes as something as to keep continuity with the situation before 1991, because I'm not sure colleague mentioned that, but we had, uh, yeah, I, I think you mentioned that, that we had uh, not only civil code, but we have a code on economic, uh, economic code, yeah, at that time. So the relationship between uh, state organizations in business were not governed by civil code, but by economic code. And I understand that the, uh, that the reform in 1990 was just trying to, to continue in this practice to have special code for B2B transaction and some special code for C2C transaction. But actually, at the end, it was really a mess because be, uh, this commercial code was applied at the end also to C2C transactions and uh, civil code, uh, and only civil code, and so civil code without uh, commercial code was applied to certain B2B transactions as well. Yeah, so, so there was really unclear borders, unclear borders uh, where the civil code uh, or commercial code uh, should, be, should be applied. And moreover, commercial code was special act to, to to the civil code, so, so civil code was applied any time. Yeah, so. The major amendment of the civil code was based on the civil code of 1950, and that was not the, the good base for the commercial relations. So uh, the commercial code was based on, on, the tra on, on the international trade code, so that was maybe, maybe the reason they wanted to do it rash, quickly, and then, then these two ways were clear. It was already mentioned that it was only a transitional solution. It was planned to be for five years, not uh, 20. Yeah. And uh, uh, definitely during that, uh, these uh, 20 years, there was not only Professor Eliash draft, there were some others, but only Professor Eliash was so persistent that he achieved the adoption. <laughs> yeah. But there was some uh, proposal from uh, 1990s yeah, and then 2000 and something that was another proposal, but these were not so successful. successful. Um, is there any French influence on maintaining this uh, dichotomy in private law in, in your country? Because in France it, uh, it persists and... Yeah, definitely nothing huge. I will have to like, look at the, at the presentation whether I mentioned that, but uh, nothing uh, really substantial. Yeah, so we don't have too much common with French law. So, so and uh, moreover, uh, we don't speak so much French as German. So, <laughs> so as my colleagues mentioned, we try to find some inspiration which is accessible for, for, for lawyers, and definitely that's, that's uh, better, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, German, uh, German, uh, German law, or, the, or uh, Austrian one, yeah. But I have a look, uh, and I, I can tell you during break uh, whether there was some, some inspiration in, 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 in French law, from French law. If I may add, uh, because all these things related to dichotomy of private law is related to cultural and sociological and historical factors. In France, this dichotomy persists uh, because in the 70s, uh, the doctrine was uh, not uh, uh, close to the idea of unification of private law. And 
the question was how to do it, and, and it, if it was a good, idea, uh, a good idea. And we have three obstacles, and maybe these obstacles are somehow similar everywhere, but in, by, in French, the French situation is always this, uh, it's a specific problem, is the existence of a commercial jurisdiction uh, uh, that uh, it's very old, the Tribunal du Commerce. And it, it, if it, there is an unification, it implies to unify as well the juridical system. The second obstacle was the spirit of laws. Uh, by uh, French civil code, the idea was acquisition of the property uh, the obligation uh, law was turned to the acquisition of real estate property. And uh, commercial laws is more uh, the acquisition of uh, the property by uh, free exchange. This was not the same spirit. And maybe the third obstacle in France is the, uh, linked, uh, the links that commercial law has with public law. It's not the case in civil law. And civil law are not very... Uh, habituated to, to have contact with economic law, public law, and maybe this is the reason maybe in France uh, still it, the, the dichotomy persists, and I think in some countries, I don't know uh, uh, yours, but in some, uh, in some countries uh, this uh, dichotomy, uh, finding these three reasons may be uh, the real reason, except for these countries like Brazil that doesn't know anymore a specific uh, commercial jurisdiction. Thank you. I'm sorry, I find that we haven't, well, at least as far as I found just now, we have not had uh, any inspiration from Kotsev. <laughs> I think Professor Josipovic also wanted to pose a question. You can keep it. That we cannot compare civil codes from uh, 18.4 or 18.11 with modern civil codes. I think that civil codes uh, in that time, uh, 20 years ago, uh, had quite different roles in society in compare with role that civil codes have now. And that uh, the level of education, the, the um, society is quite changed. And that I think that today legislators do not think uh, when they create uh, civil law norms, whether they are directed to business or to, to uh, citizens, they just want to regulate uh, the private role relations and to, to, to create the rules uh, that are based not only for behavior, but also for judges, for everybody. So I think that this... Um, discussion how to, uh, whether to use one sentence or three sentences in modern society has quite different dimension in compare with uh, beginning of um, uh, 19th century when it was a change from feudal system to capitalism. So it's, I think that it's, it's not possible to compare. And the second, what I wanted to say, I think that it's same as in, in Czech Republic. So the reason for using German systems as model was not only uh, the good knowledge of German language, but also a tradition. I think that we all had already a German tradition uh, in our legal system, uh, not only from even from Austrian monarchy time. And uh, it was a kind of, uh, the reason in explain is that we wanted to have continuity in some uh, legal relations, for example, in property law. Uh, so, and uh, there was, um, it would be too revolutionary to change the whole concept of some private law relationships. And because of that, we just, adopted uh, some already existing principles uh, based on German law to new relations and new society. Oh, just thank you for saying that because ABGB, it's not foreign law for us. It's ours in, in the same way as for the Austrian colleagues. So uh, the first commission on ABGB was, was in Brno in today's Czech Republic. So, so it's really our roots, and there are our roots, and that's, that's not the, exactly what you said. Perhaps one more sentence to what Tatiana just mentioned. Um, 
I would agree with you that um, perhaps the language of codes is not as important as anymore as it had been 200 years ago. Um, I, I wouldn't say it does not play any role, but uh, it's, it, uh, perhaps things have changed. But on the other hand, how is someone, in what way is someone being informed about the legal situation? And in many cases, the role of the code nowadays is, has been replaced by, say, pre-contractual information. Uh, pre-contractual information, parts of which are addressed to provide information about the legal situation. And if we take a look at uh, what Professor Wickers mentioned, what, what the EU provides, the European Union provides in the field of pre-contractual in information, I'm not quite sure whether an average consumer is able to understand and an average consumer is willing to read. Uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to comply because actually um, uh, uh, I don't have that much of a question but um, perhaps a small contribution because it seems to me that one of the recurring themes uh, from Professor Schauer and also uh, the other participants is about the uh, success or failure of, of drafts um, and in the future. And uh, I would like to uh, point out uh, my Belgian friend, Dirk Heibout, perhaps you already know all of this, but he wrote a very interesting article which actually is quite hidden because it's in a book uh, called Towards a Chinese Civil Code. Um, uh, so uh, not directly applicable, comparative and historical perspectives. But he wrote a very interesting article, uh, Factors Ensuring the Success or Failure of Draft Codifications, Some European Experiences. Uh, and he tries to analyze what uh, you mentioned, Professor Schauer, the political uh, necessity. Um, that is also a part in this article. Perhaps it's interesting for you. Short question for a colleague from Romania. You said that although um, you have a monistic approach. Uh, there are um, still uh, in judiciary uh, commercial chambers uh, and civil chambers. Is it the reason for, we have the same, we have commercial court and uh, civil courts, although we also have monistic approach. Uh, is it the reason for this only um, because it, there are uh, commercial cases or civil cases, or there is also some differences in procedure law. Uh, because, for example, in Croatia, for commercial cases, we have different procedure rules in compare with civil cases. Uh, and because of that, it is the main reason why we have different courts for commercial and civil cases? I will answer briefly. It's about uh, leading position, president and vice president, because we have the same procedure. We have a common code of civil procedure applying to all these areas, and actually it's applying also in administrative cases. So only criminal cases are separate, with a separate uh, procedure. So there is no, uh, let's say, uh, no substantial reason to have two, uh, two division. It is considered that there is a management reason, meaning that the management of commercial cases should be swifter than the management of uh, civil cases. But unfortunately, this does not uh, happen because we see that the duration of the cases are comparable in civil and commercial. And therefore, I said, these uh, different chambers are not called anymore civil and commercial. They are called first civil and second civil because the idea was that there is no point in having this distinction. But the courts was so keen not to have the, this, uh, this merger 
because of their internal bureaucratic uh, reasons. And also, there was the idea of having specialization at the level of topics. For example, we have a chamber dedicated to insolvency. Because insolvency is in itself a different area of, uh, of law. But in contracts, civil contracts and commercial contracts, they are uh, practically identical in their general uh, treatment. Um, we had a problem, for example, just to give you an example of on the quarrel, on the topics of the quarrel. Uh, it is a problem on which uh, chamber will judge a case arising from a car accident, a car accident resulting in damages to one of the cars or to both cars, while both drivers are insured. One has insurance, uh, a goods insurance, the other one has civil liability insurance. Okay, so basically the two participants are insulated from everything because they are saying, I am insured, I have nothing to deal with, is the insurance company to deal with. Then this litigation, which is a purely tort litigation, caused by an accident, which is pure civil law, okay, between two private individuals, reaches the court as a litigation between two insurance companies, which are litigating over this. And going back to Roman law, the law of subrogation says that subrogation, personal subrogation, does not alter the object of the claim. Still, the High Court, in, uh, in a decision that is mandatory to, to all the courts, because in Romania we have this kind of uh, procedural, procedural uh, modality where a decision of the High Court in a certain uh, framework will be imposed as an official interpretation of the law to all the courts. So it's mandatory to the courts. Stated that this is a uh, trial to be uh, trialed by the former commercial uh, chamber, so by the second chamber, because it's between two companies, without any, and this came after two years prior, the same court decided that is not the subjects that uh, are important, but the object of the claim that is important. And here is a tort claim, it's not a commercial quote unquote, but a, civ a pure civil one. So you see we have these, these fights which are just making things worse because for the, um, uh, for the trial parties, this extends the period of the trial because the two chambers make ping pong with the files. It's not my uh, jurisdiction, it's your jurisdiction. No, it's not my jurisdiction, it's your jurisdiction. And this takes several months to, uh, to decide. And also, the, uh, the High Court decided that this matter of jurisdiction is mandatory. So it's part of the public order. So it cannot be decided by the parties in their contract or something like this. Uh, Piotr Stets, University of Opole. My question goes to Professor Rizio. Uh, you've used the uh, katana metaphor Okay, answering the unasked question of Professor Bill for who is the user of the code, as we know Japanese swords, the katanas, uh, are master swordsman weapon. So it's uh, definitely a tool for lawyers. And if we continue this metaphor, uh, each swordsman knows if the weapon he's using is good. And we've got three types of swordsmen, or swords persons nowadays. The judge, a child lawyer, and we've got uh, an in house counsel. And in your opinion, if we uh, you consider, consider the code to be a katana, can each of them say that what I'm using is a Hattori Hanzo katana, a very good sword? Thank you. you know, in Romania, uh, 
so-called Japanese swords are generally used by the uh, underworld that are no specialists at all. They are not samurais, they are just uh, um, uh, thugs. Um, but I think that um, the answer here really depends. The lawyers are very happy with the new codes because they are discovering uh, a lot of sources. They are looking to Quebec, they are looking to France, they are looking to Italy for uh, inspiration for their arguments. So they are very happy. The judges, they are not so happy, at, uh, especially the judges in the higher courts, because they didn't learn the new code in the law school. They are still used with the old codes. And you know, uh, there is a saying, the, uh, the author of this uh, code, Professor Stoika, uh, in the uh, foreword of his uh, 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 course, uh, stated the new code is the old code. What he was trying to say, he was trying to say that is not an abrupt uh, uh, change like it was in 1865, but it's just a continuation because it integrated the solution of the, of the Romanian courts in the past 150 years. Uh, but what he also meant, because he explained later on, he also meant to tell the judges, don't be afraid of the new code. Just take it easy and you'll see that the main principles are basically the same. You just need to tackle with the details. But still, the judges are not so friendly with the sword. Now, if the judge is the samurai, then this is not a good sword because they are not liking it. If the trial lawyer is the samurai, then it's a good sword. I think this would be the answer. Thank you. I, I wonder if I can ask about the success of the, the French civil code reforms. I, I realize that it was your colleague Lucas who was, has unfortunately had to leave who was discussing this. But as I understand it, part of the motivation was first of all to make the French civil code up to date. We can all understand that. Second, to make it more attractive as a model to be adopted in other countries, which of course in the past has been very successful, but uh, we don't know about the future. And the third was to make it more attractive to international business. And that, I think, has a double meaning. It could mean that France is a better place to do business, as well, according to the, you know, the, the, the World Trade Organization, which I think is a, uh, a nonsense, personally, but anyway, uh, that was the idea. And the other, perhaps, to uh, use French law as a law of choice. And I wondered whether any of those things have come to pass. Of course, it's early days, seven years is not very long. But do you, do you see any sign that uh, the French model is now being exported uh, to other countries, the updated French model? Um, the answer is maybe too easy, no. Uh, from, my, from my point of view, it's not the result uh, that we have achieved uh, until the moment because of many aspects. It's uh, too young. Um, I, I, I was in Brazil this uh, last month in April uh, to show the French reforms uh, already done and the new reforms that are in ongoing process discussion. And we had a, a correct audience, but people were not that interested in, in, in the new French reform of private law because Francis uh, had uh, lost a lot of its uh, prestigious in international, uh, international arena. But it's a, the, the reform was of a very high quality in my point of view. We, if we compare uh, the dispositions, the provisions, uh, the structure of our uh, law of obligations in the original version and the nowadays version, the, the quality is very high. But this, um, this double uh, maybe influence, uh, it's still to prove. We need to wait. But there is a 
a third, uh, maybe not yet uh, well uh, discovered, uh, a third um, goal, maybe, is to understand better law uh, through uh, the new codification. It means we can better understand uh, the institutions, and it helps when French uh, enterprises, French uh, businessmen or women's men, uh, <laughs> women business, um, do negotiations. They can be maybe uh, mere award, uh, aware, sorry, uh, about the, the institutions. What is a negotiation? What is an information? What is good faith? What are the real moments when a, now we have a new regulation on formation on contracts? Of contracts, it was uh, a very complicated uh, issue uh, in the French jurisprudence. If you had uh, uh, the acceptance uh, theory uh, in the moment of the formation of the contract, if, uh, the acceptation need to be delivered, uh, uh, received by the the offer or not. Uh, different uh, um, theories and and conflictual jurisprudence. All this thing is behind us, and it helps uh, maybe uh, the, these people to better understand uh, how, uh, what means a contract, different uh, parts uh, uh, of the contract to life. And in my point of view, we need not uh, to forget that France uh, decided to participate to the international competition between jurisdictions today. And they decided in 2018 uh, to build a kind of uh, international commercial chamber uh, both in, uh, in the first instance and the second instance in Paris. We have an international commercial chamber in the Tribunal de Commerce and one uh, uh, same chamber in, at the Cour d'Appel level. Why? To benefit maybe a little bit of the Brexit and to say uh, to the world that France can be a place for the international litigation, not only in, for arbitration, but also uh, before a national judge. And this uh, decision cannot be uh, dissociated from the decision, um, from the reform, because today we can, French authorities can also sell the idea we have a special chamber, special chambers in Paris that can apply uh, the law of international commercial uh, affairs, but we can also apply our, when it is the case, because parties have chosen or because the objective conflict of laws uh, leads to the application of French law, we have also, if needed, uh, a law of obligations very mo modern, very close to the uh, most, uh, most uh, um, universal, maybe, solutions. Um, this is a, a, a very important point to link the reform with this new political uh, of the French authorities to participate of, to this international competition, I think.